Hello and welcome back to another episode of my MotoGP 22 career mode and today we are finally, finally back with another race. Now I'm actually changing up a little bit from now on, I'm just going to do one race per episode so we're here for just the finish Grand Prix. I think that's round 11 of the season but to be honest I can't remember. Now since it has been such a long time since the last one I will quickly refresh you on what happened in the last race. Now, I actually qualified really well, it looked like I was going to have a really good race, but unfortunately, I made a small mistake, lost the front on the opening lap, had to drop back to the back of the field, and came all the way through to finish fifth in the end. I think the chicane was a little bit dodgy at the end of the race, if I seem to remember, but you know what, we still got fifth place, and we've got a pretty healthy lead in the standings, if we do have a quick look at that. 67 points over Samkhya Chantra, and 86 back to I Agora. So we are looking very, very good for this championship, but... Of course, we have got the Kimi Ring, which is always a weaker track for myself and a bit of a stronger track for the AI. Now, there's actually a couple of little bits to look at before we do head into the next race. And one of them is the fact that we actually have received a proposal from Red Bull KTM IO for next season. Now, of course, I'm not going to be signing that because we're going to go up to MotoGP. We've also got a new personal manager applying who is slightly better. So, oh, sorry, that's the wrong guy. This one is a, li a little bit better, you can see, on the negotiation front. So, maybe we'll have to consider that, but for now... We are just going to leave it because it, it doesn't really matter that much. And we've also had an upgrade coming, but to be honest, I actually don't know which department it is. I think it's engine, but I'm not 100% sure. So we might have a little bit more torque for this race, but that's probably not going to make much of a difference because I've not ridden this bike for so long anyway. But without any further ado, we'll head into the weekend now and I'll see you after practice. Hopefully we get directly through to Q2. So then it was actually a pretty successful practice session, to be honest, seven tenths clear of the whole field. I did do a few laps just to get into it because, to be honest, I've not ridden the Moto2 bikes for so long in this game. But I'm actually quite surprised because usually Kimi Ring is a very weak circuit. Now, I know that AI do make a bit of a step, so going into qualifying two, the AI probably will move forward a little bit. But I think we actually could have the potential to have a good weekend here, which is great because on the previous game, I, I really struggled. I think I qualified like outside of the... The, the Q1. So anything's really an improvement from that, but without any further ado then, we'll get into qualifying two, and let's see if we can go for pole. So I actually stayed on top on combined times, which is always great to see. It means the simulated times are not completely ridiculous at the circuit. And you can see coming through Q1, we've got Jeremy Alcoba, Manu Gonzalez, Simone Corsi, and Barry Baltus. So I actually only used one set of tyres in free practice one. Now the lap time I did do was on power mode three, and that's just because, to be honest, I was doing lap by lap, I'd done two laps and I was like, oh, I may as well just complete it. But at this point of the season, we have such a big lead and the bike is already pretty good. I, I'm not too worried about upgrading, so I probably will stop doing the practice programs from this point in the season onwards, to be honest. But obviously, I always need to do some kind of lap time in practice to actually get through. So sometimes I, I might see it fit to actually do one of the programs just to give me something to, to actually focus on. But I'm liking my chances this weekend. I do think the pace is genuinely there. Uh, compared to AI on track, they, they didn't seem too fast or anything like that. Obviously, I was 7 tenths clear in the timing screens, but that's always a little bit deceiving. I've had weekends where I've been miles ahead in free practice and then struggled sort of in the qualifying and the race compared to AI, so, you know, that's certainly a possibility. But from what I've actually seen on track, they don't really seem to have an advantage of me anywhere, which obviously is, is always great. Aside from the, the usual issues where, you know, their straight line speed is pretty good. We're going to see Ben Schneider probably just rocket past me here. And then also the uh, just the general issues with Mercury B22 with the, the front being all over the place, the rear being all over the place, just the bike's not being that nice to ride. So it's really easy to make a mistake just because the, the rear just steps out on you for no reason and the front just tucks, which is uh, reminds me why I kind of didn't play this game as much as I probably should have done. So hopefully Mercury B23 will be a bit better. But into the qualifying mindset then, we've just got to go for one hot lap. Hopefully it is good enough. If I can just put a clean lap together, I think I should be pole position, but you never know how they might step it up. So here we are then about to start our flying lap, turn one. You want to make sure you get that one right. It is a tricky little breaking zone. Just gets quite blind on the entry, but uh, we've not done it too bad on this occasion. So coming towards the line then, we've closed up a lot to Navarro. What's this time going to be? 47.5. That's 2.8 seconds quicker than Jorge Navarro, I think I did a 49 to 9 in the first session, so how I found two seconds compared to my free practice time, I have absolutely no idea. But yeah, I don't see them beating that, to be honest. <laughs> 2.8 seconds is one hell of a gap, so yeah, I cannot see them beating that at all. So I think we're going to have pole position here. I'm just going to show you that we're definitely on 120% AI as well, because sometimes when you get a big gap like this, it's almost unbelievable. 
So back of the pits, we press race options. You can see it is locked to 120%, so I can't change it. So that is genuinely the pace of the AI here. So we have almost three seconds over the field. So I'm just going to skip to the end of the session, and I'm going to guess wrong pole position. Now, this is going to be one of the weirdest weekends I've had, because I came into here thinking it's going to be really difficult. I'm going to struggle loads and all the stuff that I usually have coming into the Kimi ring, because I do tend to struggle a little bit at the circuit. But Ron Paul, by an absolute massive margin, two seconds, killer of some cat Chantra. Then we've got Barry Boltus in third place and Bo Benchard in fourth with Jorge Navarro in fifth. So where is Iagora at? Iagora third in the championship, down in 14th place on the grid. So yes, my number one rival is right up there with me, half a second clear of the rest of the field. But... To be honest, I think this is going to be an absolute cakewalk for us based on the qualifying and the practice. So that's a bit of a shame. Just I, I don't know why the AI is so weak in Moto2 this year. It seems like every race we seem to be dominating. But you know what? It is AI. They might chuck a silly move. I might fall off. So I guess you never know what's going to happen until the checkered flag comes out. So we'll head into the race now then. And hopefully, hopefully we can finally get another win. Well, I've got to say, fair play to Barry Baltus. I know I did just say that he got third place on the grid, but it hasn't really sunk in until I've just seen him on the front row there. We've had a couple of races like that this season where we've had a random guy on the front row, so it will be interesting to see how he fares, because a lot of the time they do slip back a little bit, so I guess we'll have to see. So it could be a straight fight between myself and Chantra. Now, I think if I get a clear lap, I'm probably going to pull away, but like I said, you, you don't know what they are going to do. They are absolutely crazy, especially at this track. They do like to dive bomb you into, I think, turn three, so... We'll have to watch out for that, and maybe the run down the straight towards turn four, they might be able to have a pop there as well. So it's not completely sealed up yet, but I think if we get a clear first lap, it will be. Now, in terms of tyres, I think medium, medium has got to be the way to go. That's just a standard tyre on this game, and it's worked perfectly all weekend. Practice, qualifying, everything has worked, so I don't see any reason to change the tyres this close to the start of the race. But we'll get the race started then now. The start is going to be important because if we do struggle off the start, then we actually might struggle to get back through the AI. I'm almost hoping to some extent that we do struggle off the start because I don't want, I don't want to pull away and win. That's just, that's just a bit boring, isn't it? There's only a few moments left until the start of the Finnish Grand Prix. Riders have their eyes fixed on the lights and are ready for the off. Well, I've got to say, it is a good sign that I've just watched the warm-up lap and they all ran wide on the run into turn one. So maybe the AI will do that. But the lights are on now, waiting for the lights to go out here. Lights out and away we go. A pretty decent start. Is Chantra going to do anything down towards turn one? Going to tip in. He's not managed to do it, so we've actually got the whole shot, which is not too hard to get at this circuit because it is a pretty short run to turn one. But you know how these things are sometimes. But into turn four. We've ran really wide. Where am I going? I'm all the way to the long lap penalty. We've run super, super wide. So we are going to lose quite a lot of positions. Baltus now leads the race. We're in the middle of the pack. But I braked where I thought I was supposed to break. And we've run massively wide. We've had that a few times this season. So this Ital Trans still struggling a bit on the brakes. I have no idea what the AI are doing. Why are they leaning like that? Down towards the hairpin. We're back up into second place. Arbolino now leads. Although Arbolino is going so slow. We're going to try and go around the outside of Arbolino. Have I pulled it down? No, I've not. Oh, Arbolino does lead very briefly. But we're back up into second place. There's been a crash. Chantra has dropped down to fifth. Now sixth place. So it's not Chantra that's gone down. I think it might be Baltus because Baltus has disappeared. We've got a track limits warning. So we've got to be careful. So a little bit of a hectic first half. I thought I'd got it won after the first corner, but I've run a bit wide. Up the inside we go, though, of Tony Arbolino. Back up into the lead of the Finnish GP. And I think maybe from there we might have it. But, of course, we have got to be careful that we don't do... Another long lap penalty. Obviously, we effectively did one ourselves there. But I have no idea what happened. I braked pretty much where I thought I'd been braking in practice and qualifying. And I just went completely straight on. It is one of those corners that's a bit tricky. Because obviously, you've got a bit of a lean angle whilst you're braking. So it's obviously quite easy to lose the front. So maybe on the first lap, I was just a bit careful. Maybe I didn't put the brake pressure on like I normally do. And that was enough to go completely straight on. But no no worries whatsoever. We've taken the lead. We've got 1.3 already. Another track limits warning. So I need to be careful. I'm picking these up in strange places. It's like the inside of the corner, like right on the like change of direction point for some of these. So I don't know what I'm doing particularly. I need to watch out. But we've just put another 0.9 to the AI. So there's nothing, nothing you could do when you have a track like this for the AI. They're just so weak. And I don't know why you think this kind of stuff can't get past testing. But unfortunately it does. I mean, we saw what happened when the Superlight game came out. Uh, the races didn't even work in that. So... Gives you uh, an idea of the quality of the QA. But on the bright side, we've got Joe Roberts in third place. So that's a double little trans podium. We've had that a couple of times this season. Roberts' AI is doing pretty well. But actually, in even better news, 
Where's Chantra? Chantra's completely gone outside the top eight, so we are going to gain huge points here if we can keep on board this. And there's another crash. I've been seeing a lot of yellow flags popping up, so we might have to go back and have a look at the crashes, uh, see what's happened, because there's not going to be a lot of other action in this race. So the gap didn't actually go up that much on that lap. It's only 2.4, so I only gained a few temps. But you can see I'm back in the 49s now, whereas in qualifying it's in the 47s, so I'm probably on the AI's pace now, roughly, but... We're already got, well, we've got a lot of pace in hands. If they did start to catch me back up, I could obviously push on a lot more. But we've already got such a big lead, three seconds. There's nothing going to do about that. There's been another crash behind. And that can't be helping them. But I think Chantra might have crashed at some point because he's still not even up into the top eight again now. I see Corsi up there, and I'm pretty sure Corsi uh, was down in about like 19th place. Well, not 19th because he was in Q2, but he was down pretty far on the grid. So there must have been some kind of carnage for him to get that high up. Vietti, Fernandez, Alcoba, and Arenas are all just gone down together as well. Gonzalez back up into the top six. Antonelli and Ben Schneider. Well, Ben Schneider qualified quite well, I think. Antonelli definitely didn't. Uh, ben Schneider just fell off. So the AI is all crashing as well. So it's not even the fact that uh, I'm just so much faster. It looks like they're all going to fall off anyway. Obviously, Arbolino and Roberts haven't fallen off, and neither has Acosta. I think Gonzalez has stayed on, but I would say pretty much everybody else... Oh, and Corsi, of course. But I'd say everybody else behind really has fallen off, because you can see Zonta and Antonelli, they are usually right at the back of the grid, so for them to be up in the top eight would kind of suggest that everybody in front has actually fallen off, so yeah, if you look at the map as well, they're just kind of scattered everywhere. What a what a bizarre race this has been. But really, can you expect anything else? Returning to MotoGP 22, of course it was going to be a weird race. <laughs> I kind of remember myself saying this very often now that the race was strange. I think that's just this game in a nutshell, so yeah, I don't know why I'm surprised. So we're coming towards the end of the final lap then now. And you can see not a lot's changed at all. Obviously we've pulled further ahead. We're now five and a half seconds in the lead. But the order hasn't really changed at all. So I think once the pack got broken up, I think they've sort of crashed less. And you can see the uh, the map hasn't changed a lot either. So it does seem like that a lot of the front runners crashed early on. And then they probably crashed into each other again because of that. But I think once they sort of crashed a second time, they're either out the race or they're sort of on their own. And they seem to have managed to stay on so far. But so, so bizarre. But we come through the final turn. We're going to be back to winning ways on our return to MotoGP 22 career mode. And in an absolutely dominant fashion. So their fastest laps are actually not as bad as you would have thought. I think some of them are simulated. You can see Zonta's 49.6 there compared to like the 50 dead of Arbolino in second position. And for Roberts in third. 49.0 for Acosta. Yeah, I could perhaps believe that. But you can see how far they are behind. Let's have a look where our championship contenders finished. And they both retired, I think. Oh no, Agora was 25th, but he was 21 seconds off the win, and Sumkiat retired, so Sumkiat must have crashed very early on and retired. Thinking of other top-level riders, Fernandez is somewhere up there in the championship, he's retired. Lowe's, I'm not sure where Lowe's is in the championship, but, you know, he's a very fast rider in this game, so 24th place for him. Bobier 21st, Vietti 18th, so a lot of the top-hitting riders are out. To be fair, probably the most prolific threat is Joe Roberts. I think Joe Roberts is somewhere up there in the championship, I think Arbolino's not a million miles out either, so those two have definitely benefited from this race. So looking at the championship standings then, I've now extended my lead to 92 points ahead of Sunkiat Chantra. So what a dominant season we're having. Every time we have a bad couple of races, well, I mean, I came second or fifth, it's not the end of the world. But every time we have a couple of races when we don't win, when we finally do win again, it is a strange race. And the, just, the lead just keeps going up and up. Now, I was actually bang on about the uh, the riders there. You can see, obviously, Chantra stays where he is, but Roberts and Arbolino now move up to third and fourth, ahead of Ayagora and Marcel Schrotter. I actually forgot about Schrotter. Then you've got Dixon in seventh. He didn't score. Vietti didn't score. I don't think Ben Schneider scored. Obviously, Acosta's moved up a fair few positions there. Augusto Fernandez is 14th in the championship. I remember him being the second place at one point in this championship after the first couple of races, so that's quite incredible. Sam Lowe's 15th, so some of those riders there were already pretty far down the championship. Zonta moves up quite a few, well, he moves at one place, but he's got 14 points now. Sean Dillon Kelly moves up quite a few positions, so a bit of a shuffled up championship based on that race, but that's really benefited us. But 91 points now after just over half the season being completed, it is looking like it is going to be our championship. Now, of course, that can still come tumbling down, but it is, it is a huge, huge lead, and if Chantra has more races like this, then we'll be wrapping up the championship before you even know it. Looking at the team's championship, it's a similar story. Obviously, both of us actually being very, very fast. To be fair, Roberts is right up there in the championship as well. Yes, I've got almost double. In fact, I have got double his points and then one more. Compared to the rest of AI, he's performing pretty well. I mean, he's 
third in the championship, so you can't really ask for much more. Honda Team Asia are now 103 points behind. Mark VDS are third, and Rebel KTM IO are fourth. And to be honest, Rebel KTM IO, neither of their riders are anywhere. Sam Lowe's is like 15th in the championship for Mark VDS, so really, it is only going to be Idemitsu that can stop us, and it's such a huge lead. I mean, I know in the Team Championship it's easier to get a sway. You can get a sway of 45 in a weekend, but even if we didn't score for two weekends and they came 1-2, we'd still be winning, so... It looks like we're going to just dominate both championships, so maybe we'll have to change up a little bit. Maybe I'll have to start starting at the back of the grid. I think I did promise that in one of the races and then struggled a lot uh, in the actual qualifier. Well, it ended up raining, I think, so I think I, I decided not to do it. But I definitely have to have a look at doing that because especially once we've won the championship, like if I win the championship early, I think I'll probably start from the back in all the races after that one. But with that weekend done now then, we'll head back to the career hub, see what we got for this weekend, do anything we need to do before the next race, and then we'll end off the episode. So obviously, the perfect weekend we could have got for the reputation. Pole position, meeting the objective, of course. Winning the race and meeting the objective there, of course, as well. Gives us 10,200 reputation points, which takes us up to 159,700. And of course, on the credits, we got 13,890, 3,000 for winning the race, and 10,890 for actually getting the top five objective. After the research data, we managed to pass three of the objectives in practice. Now, to be honest... One of them was glitched. It passed immediately. As soon as I started the session, I went into the pit lane and it passed it immediately for me. So I don't know why that happened. And then weirdly enough, I haven't got best sector time in the race, which I do find a bit hard to believe considering we had such a pace advantage of the AI there. So I think the simulated times might have stopped us from getting that one. But we've got plenty of research data and all the different components. So if we keep at that, we can continue at growing the bike if we want. But like I said, I probably will stop because we've got a huge lead in the championship now. There's actually a couple of notifications to deal with here as well. Another proposal. This one from SpeedUp. So SpeedUp won us for next year as well. And then on the personal manager, we've got Mark Torres applying. Now, you see, this is the kind of guy that I would accept. And A, probably wait a little bit more to see. But I probably will hire a new one for MotoGP so that we do get a decent contract. And then on the technical staff, again, the similar kind of stuff. Just going to wait. Ike Carrizo. The amount of times I've seen that particular name is ridiculous. They do need to sort out the, uh, the name generation. In fact, there might even be one that works for us already. No, there's not. But the the amount of times that I see Ike Carrizo pop up on both games, on MotoGP and Superbike, is, is quite ridiculous, to be fair. But we'll keep advance for, advancing forward to the next weekend so that we can just leave it off for the next episode. But you can see we've got more contract notifications here. And we've actually got a few notifications of the headquarters as well. So I'll look at these contracts here. We've got another proposal from Mooney VR 46 So all these guys are interested in hiring us for next season. But of course, we're not sticking around in Moto2 for next year. We're going to try and win the championship and move up. And then with the personal manager, we've got another one, Johnny Thunder. Now, that's a pretty cool sounding name. And this is the kind of guy I'm going to hire because he's not worse in any department. So obviously, I'm not going to hire him right away. I'm going to reject these other guys, but I'm not going to hire him right away. But he's the kind of guy that I would hire going into MotoGP because he's just an improvement in all areas except one. But then he's not even the downgrade there either. So it'd be a no-brainer. But with that dealt with, that pretty much brings this episode to a close. So sorry if it is a bit of a short one. The race was kind of boring. Hopefully the video is still a decent length because of course I'm going back to one race per episode. Let me know what you guys think of that as well. Let me know if you're happy to see MotoGP 22 career mode back because it has been a hell of a long time. But like I said, I hope you did enjoy that one. Hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Hope you're all safe and I shall see you in the next one.